welcome to the 2010 Townsend Debate, the Outstanding Communication and Agriculture Competition. My name is Abigail Boron, and I am the coordinator for this year's debate. And I just want to welcome you for coming this evening and, and showing your support to the students. Thank you for doing that. Through the generous support of Wayne Townsend, uh, the College of Agriculture has had the privilege of being able to sponsor this event um, annually since 2004. And I would say we can call this an annual event, but it's definitely not a typical event. The topics that we face or that we deal with each year are very challenging. Um, we've been looking at organic foods, bioenergy, um, uh, rural economy in Indiana, as well as pork production in Indiana. And I would say that the, the students that we also have are extremely high capability. Um, hardworking and they have done very well in their teams and so again this is no exception to the rule this year and the topic that we are facing is um, land grant universities are positioned to solve 21st century problems and I think this is a very interesting topic for all of us to look at because as we are each very well invested into this into this university and as far as our research goes as well um, this is going to be a very interesting topic, and I'm looking forward to listening to the team's debate this evening on this. Also, as a newer researcher in my field, I was once posed with a question that I kept coming back to time and time again. And one of those questions, and this question in particular is, um, is the course of ideo ideologies today driven by funding opportunities, or is it driven by creative inquiry? And I think it's a valid question, because as we look at the various opportunities and challenges that we face, in higher institutions of or higher learning, higher institutes of, of learning, um, it's a very interesting question, and I think it's none, not any different to look at it in terms of land grant universities as well. So I, I believe tonight that that these students are going to be facing that particular question, as well as a number of others that they will bring up to be able to support their debate and as in terms of the affirmative or the negative. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask each of them to stand up and, and introduce themselves. Um, but before I do that, I do just want to acknowledge that the teams themselves have put in very, very much of hard work and dedication. And um, I also, as you're aware, we have uh, the negative and the affirmative. Only a half hour ago did they find out which side they were debating. So they did have to prepare ahead of time for both sides of the debate. So for the last month, or maybe a little over a month, they have actually been doing research in terms of collecting resources and interviewing individuals to bolster their debate on both sides. And so <coughs> tonight we will see how they handle those sides. It'll be very good. Overall, it is a significant time commitment. So I'd like to commend them for putting the time and, and the effort into this and um, preparing for a, a very good debate this evening. So with that, I'd like to start um, on this side with introductions, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Mann. I'm going to be graduating this May, and I'm double majoring in agriculture education and agriculture economics. I'm Becca Nortrip, a senior as well, but my major is agricultural education, and I'll be graduating in May. Good evening. My name is Michelle Steinbarger. I'm a junior in ag business management, and I'll be graduating in May 2012. Hello everyone, my name is Bruce Cooley and I'll be, I'm a senior in agricultural and biological engineering and I'll graduate in December. My name is Kim Hoeing, I'll also, I'll be graduating in May, not December, and I'm a senior in ag economics. Hey everyone, I'm Bo Williamson and I'm also a senior in agriculture economics graduating this May. Very good, thank you guys. Also, as part of this competition, we have an essay contest, and any, any of the students that are participating in this debate also have the opportunity to do, as an optional, part of the competition, an essay contest, or participate in the essay contest as well. I'm asking that they, they write on the affirmative side, um, no more than 500 words, and the intent is that the winner of that essay contest will then be, their essay itself will be used in a future publication that comes out of the Ag Communication Service, as well as be interviewed for a feature story as well. Um, of course, what would a debate be without the judges who decide who the winner is? So I'd like to acknowledge our judges panel this evening. Um, we have Dr. Chuck Hibbard, who is the director of Purdue Extension. Dr. Natalie Carroll, who is a professor and ex 
extension 4-H specialist. Dr. Sean Duncan, who is a professor in animal sciences, and um, Christy Kras, who is the research and development communications leader at Dow AgroSciences. So thank you guys very much for coming to this evening. <laughs> and above all, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Wayne Townsend and his commitment to Purdue and his strong desire to give back to the students at Purdue in the College of Agriculture. And of course, Dr. John Graville in the Office of Academic Programs um, for the support and the planning and um, promotion of this particular event and debate and competition. So with that said, I think it's time to begin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, from a student's perspective, I just want to thank you again. This has been a lot of time on our parts, but we have thoroughly enjoyed the time of getting to, to learn more about the land-grant institution that we're at. And we have a special thanks for Mr. Wayne Townsend. We're, we're, uh, it's unfortunate he couldn't make it here tonight, but he um, was the great visionary of this debate, as Abigail mentioned. But today we're not here to talk about Mr. Townsend's greatness. We aren't, talk about his, we aren't here to talk about his outstanding contributions to his family, his community, his university, or his state. We're here to talk about a resolution, a resolution that, stands, that our team stands in affirmation of, a resolution that states, land-grant universities are positioned to solve 21st, 21st century problems, and they are going to accomplish this through educating tomorrow's thought leaders. Before we begin we, to address this topic, we need to take a step back in history. The year is 1862. America is in the midst of the Civil War. Among all the other things that are going on in the Congress's mind, one man had a vision, and that man was named Justin Smith Morrell, a young congressional representative from the state of Vermont. This son of a shop clerk was indeed a revolutionary. He set into place a comprehensive, far-reaching system that forever changed the educational landscape. Through the adoption of the Morrell Act of 1862 and the subsequent acts that followed it, the land-grant university system has been set up to be the greatest practical education component in the history of education. Ladies and gentlemen, again, land-grant universities are positioned to solve 21st century problems, and they are accomplishing this and will continue to accomplish this through educating to tomorrow's leaders. Land-grant universities have continued to provide the best in practical education for their students. And land-grant universities are continually creating an army of change agents in communities, in the states, in the countries, and ultimately in the world. In, August, in the August 2001 issue of the Journal of Agricultural and Applied Economics, Dr. Michael Martin tells us, and I quote, the very essence of the land grant was and is to break tradition and convention. And that essence to break tradition is exactly what allows land-grant universities to have continually provided the best practical education for its students. Faculty and professor have, been, have used the ever-evolving pursuit of non-traditional approach to, the, to their research, to their outreach, and to their education of tomorrow's thought leaders. And in doing so, they have better educated their students. Now, my opponents might say that since those researchers have divided attentions, again, outreach, education, and their own research, they might provide a mediocre education. So yes, professors do have divided attention, but isn't that the very essence that makes the land-grant university experience so outstanding? Dr. Norman Slomeka, in his article, An Examination of Trace Storage and Free Recall, tells us that the mind must have something to recall. It must have an experience to capture the essence of what we're learning. And that's precisely what land-grant university professors are doing through their divided attention. Land-grant universities are continually creating an army of change agents in a community, in the states, in the countries, and in the world. You know, my dad always used to tell me past performance is the best indicator of future success. Well, when I survey the history of land-grant universities, I'm proud of that past. The richest part is marked by men like Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution, and <laughs> Jabisa Ajeta, the 2009 World Food Prize winner for his work in sorghum, a crop that feeds 8% of the world. And where do those men come from? Where do they receive their education? 
You guessed it. Land grant universities. Tomorrow's problems are not known. It is going to take thinkers, those scientists and researchers that sit in labs in the private sector to confront those looming challenges. And where are those men and women, those world changers coming from? I'll tell you where. Here's some facts to prove that. 60% of all of the PhDs, 35% of all the master's degrees, and 70% of all the engineering degrees come from, you guessed it, land-grant universities. Ladies and gentlemen, it's clear. It's very clear, in fact. Land-grant universities are positioned to solve 21st century problems. And they are and will continue to accomplish that through their sound, practical education of tomorrow's thought leaders. Okay, well, we were, oh, I'm sorry, so you guys can hear everybody. Um, we had some points that we wanted to ask you about your position, and we were wondering about some of the, um, how you guys were talking about how faculty is very diverse. They have to do lots of things, have to write grants. So we were wondering how, if they might be not utilizing their abilities to the fullest by having to write grants and doing a lot of the paperwork that may be wasting time and money and not being able to promote that just to education. Okay, I'll, I'll address that. So the question here becomes, who is actually doing the changing, right? Um, from our perspective, Langer universities, even from their fundamental components, have been about educating tomorrow's thought leaders. Private, the private industry is made up of a lot of college graduates. A, a vast majority, you heard the number, 60% of all PhDs are from land grants. Those are the people sitting in the labs at Alanco Animal Health, Eli Lilly, other companies just like it, Kraft Foods, we, we get to just. They're the people that are solving the, the big problems. But here's the key. We can't jump too quickly. Where did they learn how to do those? Where did they learn about the fundamental research approach? It was from those university professors with split time, which is pretty outstanding because they were allowed to have, um, the university allowed them to do the research, to be able to better bring in an educational component into their classroom, and then to allow their students to better learn from their, their victories and also their mistakes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, also, you talked about the Green Revolution, and that has been over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and we're still seeing effects of that. And so, I was, you talked about the solutions and things that they're finding to help with that, and how, we, how is that, are we losing focus of the goals that we've set for that, or was that just a theory that has not been impl implemented throughout the years? Could you help me understand your question? Just how um, are the theories that yeah. we're coming up with to um, solve like, things like the Green Revolution? Mm -hmm. are, those actually just theories that people and professors are coming up with, or are they actually implementing that within the community? I mean, if you look recently, 2009, it could be. Okay. Thank you. Hello. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I know we are on the negative side of this statement here. And so um, I wanted to write down exactly, sorry, I wanted to discuss that some of the issues that are challenging our land-grant universities and how they're affecting our ability to solve these 21st century problems of today. Um, as we all attend this wonderful land-grant university, I would like to draw attention to a few of the blemishes that are holding our ability, holding back our ability to promote students and faculty to better solve these 21st century problems. And so I wanted to go on to discuss the education, the extension, and the research all being done as the three main drivers for land-grant universities and how they have been successfully implemented in the past, but are we currently seeking drastic changes in the educational system is forcing us to rethink and restructure some of our core values. Education is the sole reason land-grant universities were founded. We believe that this is still the focus of land-grant universities, but we must ask ourselves, are funding and government supports eroding our ability to teach most effective ways to prepare the students of today for the challenges that they will be facing tomorrow? Education starts with teachers. And currently, land-grant universities are not able to pay, pay their faculty the salaries that they deserve due to the insufficient funds from the government. The National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges stated that land-grant universities are only able to pay 79% of what private universities pay their faculty. This is putting a strain on the grant, grant universities' ability to retain some of their most outstanding faculty and brilliant minds. Also due to the decrease in funds, the Foraging and Foundation for the Future reported that Lang Grant University's tuition is continually raising at 2.24 compounded rate of increase. The lack of government funding for higher education is not from the result of increasing, unable to increase taxes, but is for the budget that the government is using to cut for higher land grant universities. And also, I wanted to point out that land grant universities are continually losing support of, from the government into our educational system and this is hurting our generations and our generations to come. And requiring land-grant universities to search for additional avenues for funding. If we cannot find ways to keep land-grant universities cost down, we're going to lose brilliant minds who are unable to pay for higher education and will not be able to solve these 21st century problems. Industry is an additional avenue that land-grant universities are currently using to make up for the loss of government funds. Industries are pumping a lot of money into the land-grant university system to compete for schools and most qualified graduates. The concern with this industry money shows that the university, it, universities that are land grant are being pressured to accommodate specific industry leaders so that they will continue to fund our universities financially. There are already signs of this influence. As you can see on State Street, there's a building being built for hospitality and tourism management and is sor its source of funding is from the Marriott. There's also been pressure from the industry to have private career fairs. And how much money are we willing to accept before that we, we think that that's a, a capable thing or that they deserve it? And industry leaders are also organizing committees of faculty from land-grant universities and draining the knowledge out, not giving the land-grant universities the credit that they deserve. And it's not, and they are holding that information not for the public good that it would be used if it was through the land-grant universities. Um, extension is also an important part of the land-grant universities. And it, but it is soaking up lots of funds that can be used elsewhere. Extension has been widely used in the past, but is becoming in, increasingly unutilized by the public. Their original function is to help committees teach life skills, which is now being substituted by other company organizations, like hospitals teaching students and adults about healthy eating habits and seminars to address teen pregnancy. Another function of extension is to help small farmers. But as we've seen in the trend of agriculture, is that we are becoming more commercialized. And these commercialized farmers are going straight to the universities, bypassing the extension. For example, my extension office at home is consolidating their facilities to cut costs. But are we overworking our extension educators and faculty so that they cannot even do their jobs even with more people? I'd like to close with, public universities are too important to this country to permit them from deteriorating according to the National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges. But land-grant universities are going to have to find a way to restructure themselves to solve 21st century problems. Land-grant universities play an important role in our country, but the pressure of financial backing 
industry involvement, and decreasing community support are clouding the land grants university's abilities to produce individuals that equipped. Thank you. Well, Michelle, Michelle, you said it yourself, land grant universities are an amazing place. You also mentioned that the core values have been, you know, restructured. What core values are being restructured? Well, we um, looked at Purdue's strategic plan that they are having now, and things that they want to do are to graduate these um, ex example, exem <laughs> excellent graduates. But, and they've talked a lot about um, also helping with the industry and being global, but the, they haven't really put a lot of structure behind it to say, okay, we want to actually have this many classes for this certain thing so they get to know what's going on in public research and things so, like that. Michelle, what specifically, what core values specifically are, are we needing to restructure? Well, just a lot of it is financial. When it comes down to land grants, we need money. We have to have money to pay our faculty. We have to have money to um, help keep tuition down to have those students. So our core values, I think, would have to be, um, are we searching for the right of avenues for money, and is it skewing our, our education by looking for industry? Are you aware that funding is not one of the core values of the land grant institution per the Morrell Act of 1862 and the subsequent acts after that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, then let's go ahead. Now, what is your solution for keeping costs down at the public university? Well, for our solution, we looked at, we are going to need um, subsidized by companies because that's who's giving us money at this time. But we really need to look at, are we making sure we're putting restrictions on that to make sure that it's not skewing our information, it's not skewing our research, mm -hmm. and really trying to pressure the government to see if that's really, um, if they can help us out any more than they can. Okay, so the solution is still here at the land grant universities, and land grant universities still are the site for solving the 21st century problems, is that correct? Is that what I hear you saying? Well, I want to, what I'm trying to say is that land, land grant universities are being challenged, so it's skewing and we're not able to, um, to solve our 21st century problems of this time. Thank you. The rich history of land-grant universities with countless advances and contributions to society are the envy of the world. The land-grant model is being replicated globally in many different countries. 
One example of this is the Terry University in New Delhi, India. This university was developed as a collaborative effort amongst North Carolina State and other universities around the globe to help solve, solve climate change issues pertinent to India and the rest of the world. The opposition may argue that there is not much difference between land-grant universities and non-land-grant universities. The primary reason for this sentiment, according to Vic Lechtenberg, Vice Provost of Engagement for our own Purdue University, is that successful non-land-grant institutions have adopted much of the land-grant mission over the past 25 years. If they have not, their funding has likely subsided and their public support diminished. Historically, land-grant universities addressed important societal challenges to be successful, almost exclusively. Now, we have competition. This competition is a testament to the success of Justin Morrill's vision and a reason why land-grant universities are a catalyst for solving 21st century problems. Many land-grant institutions have adopted a real-world approach of fulfilling the role of being a land-grant university to position to solve 21st century problems. Dr. Ian Ma of the Association of Public and Land-Grant Institutions stated, the days of the single investigator are diminishing rapidly. It's all about teams. Issues like hunger, poverty, climate change, and energy are global issues, and we must work together to find solutions to these problems. We have the very best minds in our public higher education and land-grant institutions to address these issues. On top of providing an exceptional educational experience for its students, like Bruce talked about a few minutes ago, another key advantage of land-grant institutions lies in our vast cooperative extension network, unlike what our opposition has said. Extension allows these universities to be connected to real-world problems at the base level. Land-grant universities are linked to their constituents and stakeholders across the state and the nation. This partnership serves all entities involved as it allows universities to help stakeholders with technology and the outstanding talent they have at these land-grant universities, while the stakeholders provide the institution with probing questions, insights, and what those potential problems are at the base level. My opposition might claim that co the Cooperative Extension Network is outdated, but I must disagree. The Cooperative Extension Service interacts directly here at Purdue with over 1.3 million people each year. That's nearly a sixth of Indiana's population. And that's only one of over 100 land-grant cooperative extension services in the United States. It's a pretty big number, I think. What other service and education network can make this large of an impact and seek out issues and concerns of its constituents? My opponents have said funding has been slashed for both land-grant universities and cooperative extension programs, which is true. But hasn't the continued mission of agriculture, one of the primary land-grant purposes, always been to produce more with less? Companies are laying off employees, hiring freezes are happening every day, and we're all learning to live with less. I bet each and every one of us in the room has experienced effects of our current economic situation. But this debate focuses on land-grant institutions, which are feeling the effects of a tighter financial situation, just like everyone else in the world. As funding decreases, land-grant universities have become adept at identifying and prioritizing which projects can have the biggest impact in a 21st century world. As a result of budget cuts, extension education has also been forced to adapt, and it has morphed into a 21st century technological world with developments like e-extension. We are positioned to gain access to information easily with resources like the internet. Educators have endless opportunities to develop programming and distribute it to a wide audience, all with the click of a mouse. And this trend is only going to continue in the 21st century. 21st century problems are going to rely on people's behaviors, not merely science. Making these resources available to individuals is a key element of cooperative extension and the difference maker in being positioned to solve future problems. Land-grant universities have been and will continue to be successful in the academic world. Vic Lechtenberg, once again of Purdue University, stated, I have no hesitancy in stating that we are well positioned to solve 21st century problems. What we need is resources that are targeted specifically toward collaborative research and cooperation. Our faculty and students like to solve problems. We like to know what we do is important. This is not the case in all academic institutions. Evolving concepts like e-extension and interdisciplinary research among departments allow land-grant universities
you've, you've pre presented a very interesting and positive experience about the different roles that land grant land grant space. We have a few questions for you, though. In your in your pr presentation, you you talked about teamwork. How how can land grants be expe expected to perform adequately with teamwork when everyone is competing for the same amount of grants and funding issues? You know, that's just something we're going to have to deal with in the 21st century, and that's grants. Um, talking about that teamwork. Let's start with the university right here at Purdue. Some of the issues I mentioned, like climate change, energy, um, renewable resources, some of those issues recall on departments in ag and biological engineering, uh, other forms of engineering, ag economics, uh, history even, for example. All these issues come together to tie in to teamwork that happens right here. I don't think departments within our own, univers you know, within our own university would be as competitive. Other um, universities are going to have to work together on that, too. It's a problem that we're all going to face is that lack of funding as we continue into the future. So it's definitely something that we're just going to have to work with those synergies. And there are certain examples, such as the Risk Management Agency. Any um, project that's worked on with uh, funds from that particular government organization is posted on a website, and that resource is available to anyone with those funds. So um, that's an example of a partnership that's already happening. And I think there's going to be um, government pressure as well as other pressure for some of those partnerships to continue to happen. Continuing on with your information about the extension ed education system, you talk about how they're distributing information to a wide, wide range of audiences and that they've reached 1.6 million people. How many of those 1.6 million people were repeat customers? And, and extension, those extension educators themselves in the Journal of Extension in a December 2000 publication admit that they do a poor job of marketing and that one of their biggest challenges is facing, is facing how they're going to reach these new customers who know nothing of what extension is. You know, I still think it's reaching 1.3, not 1.6, actually. So there's a little bit difference there. But with the 1.3 million customers that they're affecting, those are people who are coming to them with problems. Um, for example, one particular part of education is youth development and ag education. There are 220,000 members involved in. Adequate food, safe water, climate concerns, sustainable health, sustainable energy. These are the issues that face both America and the world in the 21st century. The question lies on whether land-grant institutions are the educational and the organization that's going to take, take these problems and face them head on. In his book, Land-Grant Universities and Extension of the 21st Century, George McDowell points out that land grants, although they have a rich history of success, have many problems in front of them. He concludes that if land grants, individually or as a collective organization in general, want to succeed in the 21st century, they must again become instruments of social change. The stumbling blocks of a land grant, of a land grant mission occur in each of its three systems. Failure of one of them affects the outcome of all as the in institution as a whole. Potentially, it could leave us wondering whether the solution to our challenges our country faces, whether it's going to provi provide solutions to those challenges, or it is simply going to be evidence of a historical generator success that has been replaced by a more effective model. Education was the founding principle of the land-grant institution, a high-quality education for the people, by the people. This education was accomplished by hiring intelligent professors that were able to mold students to the path to success by educational experiences with real-world problems. Not only was a problem solving a fundamental concept, but it was also the ability to discover and create new ideas as well as technologies that is what drove the land-grant success. Today, professors are often hired on their ability to multitask, their ability to write, write grants, proposals, develop distance learning and e-learning opportunities. The, as the University World News reports in its latest findings. What happened to the purpose of educating? That seems to be something fundamental missing in the list of how to hire a professor at a university. Not being able to foster student success or demonstrate any desire about the individual learner is a complaint that many students at large land-grant universities have. Logan Springsteen, a senior in the College of Agriculture, relates his story about a class that he was in. The very first day, the professor walked in and state, I really don't care about this class. I'm a research professor. They're making me teach it. For all the noise and excitement surrounding the university's mission towards the student engagement and promotion, where's the synchronism between these supposed educational objectives and the faculty attitudes and programs that accomplish it? Research is the driving force 
for the discovery of new technologies and the collection mode of information that are used to empower real world changes. Since most federal funding is used to pay staff and faculty salaries, most of the research money must come from private and public grants. The Scientist, a life sciences journal, reports that funding op these funding options offer less support to in-depth hypoth hypothesis-driven research. In essence, they're hindering research pro progress in lesser developed and, cre and new creative areas. The need for grant writing is taking its toll on professors as they are required to spend vast amounts of time in writing applications before they ever have a chance to do actual research. The future of research is also in jeopardy when it comes to graduate students at land-grant universities. Since funding is available to only a few specific areas of supported projects, graduate students are restricted to con conducting certain projects, which hinders their creative spirit and hurts their desire for learning and the love of information. A graduate student at Purdue University who completed his undergraduate and did private re research at a private university, Matthew Carroll, explains the two, the two different universities and his experiences. He says the push for publishable work in certain areas is hurting his individual spirit as a graduate student. He no longer wants to continue his higher, his higher, re his higher learning and education as he feels that it has become nothing more than a system to send out information. The third leg of the land-grant institution is extension. Developed to spread the knowledge in new technologies, its original purpose was, was in a way to act as a consulting service for local people and was a direct line of sharing knowledge. Today, the purpose of extension has been questioned, both on a local and a government level, as the availability of information the internet provides is now available in faster methods. Private firms and other organizations are, are offering the exact same services in a more well-known fashion. A Michigan, State University, a Michigan State University Extension Specialist, Darren Carter, relates his frustration in the extension system today. Extension is often, is often behind the curve as it takes a long time to get a publication out. Paperwork and processes take too much time. My latest, my latest work took two months to get the information out. By that time, the, ex, the information w was already outdated and pointless. This is why we nearly lost our, our extension program funding this year. Land grants are not... To start with, well, we're all students here at Purdue, which is a great land-grant university, and I um, just wanted to start off and ask you, do you think the education that you're receiving here at Purdue is a quality education? 
I believe that as a Purdue student myself, there are aspects that I couldn't get at any other university anywhere else. I do believe that we were receiving quality education. Okay. But on the same standpoint, okay, that, I feel that... That was just my question, if you thought you were receiving quality education, and that answer was yes, but... Um, I also mentioned 1.3 million people who used the extension service just last year, and one of your arguments was it's an archaic system that people are not using. What's your rebuttal for those 1.6 people that 1.6 million people that are using the system? What do you do for them? What's the value for that face-to-face um, -face connection that a lot of people in the United States still do appreciate? Well, your figure that you gave of the 1.3 million didn't indicate whether it was a face-to-face -face personal connection or whether it was so or something that they were using an educational program. The f I'm not arguing the, f the fact that extension education doesn't have a place, because it does. My argument is that extension education in its current form is not going to ser serve the needs of the 21st century. They need to be updated and technology appropriate. Okay. Transfer of information is extremely important. Um, you also talked about the um, someone for an extension education at Michigan State University. Are you aware that the president of Michigan State is a um, proponent for extension education, and she is the one who created the concept of adopting extension education to the world grant idea. What are some of your thoughts on that in um, education and the president of the university, university being in support of it? Well, Michigan State did not get rid of their, of their extension education this past year, but there was question, not from the president's standpoint, but as the government funding issue. And it, came all, and it came down to the point that the university itself needed to prove its usefulness, especially with the, educate, with the extension education program. And it wasn't arguing that the extension education didn't have a place. It was trying to justify the amount of funds that are required when you have an office in every single county. Okay. What about the graduate student funding that you mentioned? Are you aware that there are National Science Foundation grants that you can apply for and be used on any? I reiterate that we stand in affirmation of the resolution that land-grant universities are well positioned to solve 21st century problems. Sidney J. Harris once said, the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. That is exactly what land-grant universities are doing. They provide the world's thought leaders with windows into issues of society and charge them with the task of finding non-biased solutions. Land-grant universities offer an army of change, agent, change agents to deliver research that provides hope. That same hope was brought to Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolu Revolution, accredited with saving more than a billion lives through hunger. And that same hope exists today for those engaged with land-grant universities, much like us in this room. A name that many of you might be familiar with here at Purdue is Gabisa Ejeta. He is the 2009 World Food Prize laureate for his research in grain sorghum. I find it very important to note that Gubisa Ajeta is a product of land-grant universities. Both his high school and his university in Ethiopia were made possible because land-grant universities like Oklahoma State University positioned themselves there. And to think, if it were not for OSU going to Ethiopia, positioning themselves to educate the world and solve problems, we wouldn't have a Gubisa Ajeta here at Purdue, would we? There would be no Gabisa Jetta, World Food Prize winner, and over 500 million people in developing countries that depend on grain sorghum as a foundation of life would not be helped by his research. With the success of Gabisa Jetta and the impact of his work, I think it's very safe to say that land grant universities are very well positioned to solve 21st century problems. His impact on the world is evidence, it is the very proof that supports this position. The vision of 1862 that began with the Morrill Act is still a vibrant one today. Land-grant universities are the envy of the world and countless models of land grants are spreading to all parts of the globe. Now I ask, why would others imitate land-grant universities if we are not positioned well? Our opponents have failed to dismantle the arguments of my teammates Yet they continue to outlandishly argue that we are not well positioned. In layman's terms, they are basically saying the current work of students, faculty, and researchers has no value. What they've said is a figurative backhand to all knowledge seekers and educators in the university system. I'm not only surprised by their arguments, I'm offended. We are well positioned, 
because of the points my teammates have made and due to the fact that we have the future leaders, the greatest minds, the Gabisa Ajitas, engaged at land grant universities. Thank you. Um, we would like our remaining time. I think it's a minute thirty. We as a land grant system are falling out of a position to solve 21st century problems. There are significant issues that need to be examined with the model of today's land grant. Our opponents today have put a lot of focus on the history of land grants, beginning with the Morrell Act. They must have overlooked the studies that show the Morrell Act was intentionally an economic move that needed to, to pull the war-stricken United States out of its slump. By providing skills to the people, um, the United States would be able to create enough economic growth to recover from the devastation of the Civil War. And economics continues to be a major motivator behind the land grants. Education is key to any university. And land, but if land grants are consistently lacking funding to attract the outstanding faculty who can intrinsically challenge students, then how are we able to create a generation how are we able to create a generation of shining stars when the mass of individual is okay with the status quo? In addition, the demands of today's professors leave actual education in the background. How can we continue to come up with brilliant solutions to today's problems if we neglect to teach how to solve the problems in the first place? Today's extension service is less efficient than the service of the past. People search for solutions in the place where they can find instant results. And while our opponents mention that 1.3 million people use the education or the extension service, the remaining 4 million people who live, in the United, who live in Indiana would rather turn to an instantaneous form. In order to stay relevant to today's world, the, edu or the extension service will need to be transformed into an integrated team of professionals, professional problem solvers. Research is the key to problem solving, and we need research that gets to the heart of today's problems and then finds accurate results. With the lack of funding, how can we be sure that we, re we are researching the real problems and not those in the interest of our donors? And how can we connect the results of our research to the world with an inefficient extension service and uninspired students? Now this is not to say that land-grant colleges aren't important, because they most definitely are. But it is to say that they do have serious flaws that need to be looked at. The Kellogg Commission of the Future of State and Land-Grant Universities said it best when they stated, we are convinced that unless our institutions respond to the challenges and opportunities before them, they risk being consigned to a sort of Jurassic Park, a fascinating place to visit, but increasingly irrelevant in a world that has passed them by. Thank you. This now concludes our debate for the evening. We're going to take a 15-minute break, allow the judges to discuss.
uh, the, the teams themselves. And we will reconvene in here in um, at about 5, 10 after 8 o'clock. Thank you. Well, I think we have obviously come to a conclusion. And I thank you guys again for your support and your attendance tonight to support our students. Um, I will say that you guys did a great job in debating. And I thoroughly enjoyed listening to this, this discussion and this debate. I think it presented a number of, of issues that um, oftentimes are in the back of our minds and maybe we don't want to admit. But obviously, we need to face them on a daily and yearly basis as we look at our goals and objectives for the university. Um, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to allow each of the judges to offer their own um, thoughts and comments toward both of the teams. And we'll start with Christy. Okay. Um, it was, like said, a great debate, I thought. A lot of good points. I, I thought some of the strengths were definitely good delivery. Uh, grammar, I'm amazed by how few ums and likes and all of that were in there. Pretty amazing. A wide range of research and, and high level of professionalism. Uh, some areas that I think could be improved were mainly, I think, structure, just um, stating the points and then bing, bang, boom, here they are right up front so it's a little clearer of a, of a um, process. Uh, that was kind of the main thing, just stressing the ma major points. But otherwise, I thought, really good job. So thanks. Well, again, I'd like to echo, echo that uh, comment that a uh, great debate. Uh, both teams would very well. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you. Um, I'm not sure I want any of you in my classes because you're too argumentative, but uh, I thought it was a great job. A uh, couple of things, I think, for both teams. Um, one thing I thought that was missing was uh, a good definition of the land grant mission. And uh, land, you, know, you did a good job of the history but not, not so good on the mission. And then um, also, uh, many of you, as you were talking, started off with sort of the three missions, and, but only covered maybe one of them in detail and, and, and uh, didn't get to all three, maybe due to time or maybe um, because you weren't quite organized with your thoughts. Um, I guess the, the, the last item is that, um, and I've not had a lot of debate experience, uh, but I think you, as a team, probably could take advantage of the fact that you are a team, and when you start off the debate, uh, recognize the fact that you've got other support in the team that may cover uh, one of the other topic areas more in detail. So give us a little bit of a preview of who's going to do what, I think would really help in the organization. But overall, great job. Uh, congratulate uh, both of the teams, regardless of how this turns out. Um, I thought you all did a great job. I enjoyed hearing both sides, and, and I found some of the statements very thought-provoking, so that's always fun. I enjoyed being here tonight. Um, I would have liked, and there were a number of different places where I was hoping for an example that would kind of make the point. There were, I heard a number of points made, and it's like, well, how, how does that play out, or what, what would be an example? So that would have been good. But uh, I think both, of, both teams did a really outstanding job, and I commend you. I enjoyed it. Well, again, uh, commend all of you. This was a really fun debate to listen to, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I can tell you that I've heard worse negative things and more affirmative positive things, and 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 so nothing that you said surprised me, which uh, uh, maybe that's okay. A um, couple of things, uh, uh, I, I really appreciated the fact that you were so respectful of each other in this debate, and I thought that was really important because uh, after all, it is about the issue and not the people, and, and, and so I thought that was really great. A um, couple of things I thought you might be able to do uh, a little bit better. Uh, one, uh, 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 each speaker took a little different perspective, but I thought maybe the differences were more subtle than substantive. And, and so, uh, you know, you have three opportunities to make really different and profound points. And you did that to some extent, but I thought it perhaps could have been stronger. Um, this is a tough topic to really analyze and dig in and, and, and understand at a, at a, at a detailed level. 
Um, I, I would commend both teams for uh, your citations. It was obvious that you did your homework. Uh, you picked out key works or publications that really are landmark uh, uh, works on the conversation around the land-grant university. And so uh, commend you <clears throat> for that and the way that you use those. Um, I thought both teams did a nice job of combining substance with passion. And to me, that's really what debating is all about, is, is certainly the substance is the core of what you're trying to accomplish. But delivered with passion is your opportunity to really make your point. And, uh, and, and I thought both teams did that very well. Um, I do want to acknowledge the negative team from the standpoint that you had a really tough job. I, I assume you came to Purdue because you loved the opportunity to come to Purdue. And, uh, uh, and, and so maybe it was hard to say some of the things that you felt like you had to say. And so I, I want to acknowledge that because uh, I was feeling for you because I, I had the sense that it was hard to say some of the things that you, maybe not, I don't know, but that <laughs> <coughs> I had the sense. So. Uh, and at the same time, I think the affirmative team had a slight advantage because, again, you came here because you wanted to be part of Purdue and a land-grant university, and, and so maybe it was easier to take your position. But that being said, I thought both teams did a very nice job of, of arguing your points and, and uh, again, being passionate about the way that uh, you delivered those. Um, and so I think with that being said, we're ready to announce our winner. And uh, uh, I think all the judges uh, felt uh, really good about uh, both teams. Uh, but uh, to tell you tonight that the winner is the affirmative team. Thank you for your feedback. And congratulations to both of you. You guys did a fine job. We also, as you are aware, we had the um, best speaker that was judged as well tonight, and I'd like to congratulate Chelsea Mann for winning that tonight as well. <laughs> and if you are not aware, the winners of the debate tonight do each win an I a new, brand new iPad, so they will be getting that. Second place wins digital cameras, so I'd say they're walking away feeling pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are the judges? Um, <laughs> thank you again all for coming tonight, and you're dismissed. If the Two teams would please stay for a few minutes as well as the judges just so we could get a couple pictures that would be great. <laughs>